Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday devotional for October 1st, 2023. And this is the day that we, and many other churches around the U.S. and around the world, celebrate together World Communion Sunday. This is a Communion Sunday, so please do make sure you have your elements ready. Our silent meditation this morning comes from one of my favorites, St. Augustine. Oh, I just saw a cat go by. Who said this? Recognize in this bread what hung on the cross, and in this chalice what flowed from his side. Whatever was in many and varied ways announced beforehand in the sacrifices of the Old Testament pertains to this one sacrifice which is revealed in the New Testament. Amen to that. For announcements, as I mentioned, we will be having communion today, so please have your elements ready. What I have decided, um, well, at the churches, we have a variety of breads uh, representing different places and different cultures. I don't even know what they'll be yet. The uh, folks setting up communion will be picking that, so people can think about the diversity around the world and what I've decided on here is I have a piece of matzo and this was made in Jerusalem uh, the matzos that I order are apparently shipped from there via good old Amazon and I have an English sipping wine so trying to cover a few different places there other announcements today, um, let's see, well, as part of the service, you'll hear some different prayers, perhaps, than you used to, because what I've tried to do is to put together prayers from other traditions, um, Orthodox, Anglican, um, Methodist, well, you'll hear as we go along, and also coming up on October 15th. At Salem UCC in Elizabethville, that will be Laity Sunday, and we have some folks from the local fire company there, who are members of the church, who will be presenting a message called God's First Responders. And at St. Paul's in Sacramento, that'll be their 78th annual homecoming service, and members from that church will be providing the message for that day. And we'll have a group called Brothers in Grace providing music. And then a meal afterwards. If you are local, uh, please join us for either one of these terrific services on the 15th. And at St. Paul's, if you're interested in coming and also having the meal, which will be catered by Tracy's Place right here in Sacramento, um, please let me know so that we can reserve a meal for you. As far as I know, those are all the announcements. And again, it is good to be back with you. Praise God. So now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let's join together in our profession of faith. And today I've chosen the Nicene Creed, a little longer than the Apostles' Creed. And this is one that many churches use, even more than the Apostles' Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who, with the Father and the Son, is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our prayer of invocation comes from the Eastern Orthodox liturgies of Greece, Syria, and Russia. Join me now in the spirit of prayer. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit now and forever. O Lord God, your power is incomparable. Your glory is incomprehensible. Your mercy immeasurable. Your love for human beings is inexpressible. Unto you are due all glory, honor, and worship to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now and forever and even unto ages of ages. Amen. Our call to confession, which is a uh, litany, comes from the Church of England. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger, and of great kindness. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor, excuse me, I'm going to move the chair here, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy upon those who fear him. Let's take a few moments now for silent reflection and confession. And amen. Now let's join in our prayer of confession. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he set our sins from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so is the Lord merciful toward those who fear him. Bless the Lord, O my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Almighty God has mercy on us, forgives us our sins, and brings us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. We come next to our children's time, so I'd invite you to gather the young people around the device if they're not already there. Oh, look at this picture. I'm guessing this is a brother and a sister sitting at the dining room table, and what are they doing? <laughs> they're fighting over, looks like a hamburger. They're fighting over food. How silly is that? I sure hope you never do something like that, whether it's the, the dining room table or somewhere else, whether it's a meal or a snack. You know, I know your parents and grandparents have taught you, you share and you're polite. But boy, these two kids aren't. And you know what? There was a time in a church long ago when they didn't share either. It was in a city called Corinth and the Bible uh, letter writer Paul had to write to them and say, hey, you need to share. If somebody gets there early, don't eat all the food. Leave it for the people who are coming later. You need to share. So I would encourage you Always share. Don't fight over the food. That's not what God wants. Amen. We turn now to the prayers of the people, and I would just invite us into a time of silent prayer.
Amen. Amen. Let's join now in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. We come now to the reading of Scripture, and the first reading comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, beginning with verse 26. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Then we turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning with verse 43. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together, and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods, and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home, and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Lastly, we turn to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves. This is Paul writing now. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. About the other things... I will give instructions when I come. We'll be talking about that. Today's message is entitled, No Fighting at the Table, Please. Join me for a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. We could score today's three readings for World Communion Sunday as two to one, meaning 
that the first two readings, Galatians and Acts, show how well followers of Jesus should and can get along. <clears throat> ah, but then the third reading, from Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church. Well, that gives us a sad but perhaps not surprising dose of reality. In this letter, Paul addresses some inside issues that show that this whole Christian unity thing is really dependent on everyone being mindful of their fellow believers' needs. Or to paraphrase it, saying, a congregation is only one incidence of clueless treatment of its members away from more widespread problems. But let's not dwell on the negative. Well, <laughs> at least not yet. The tradition of World Communion Sunday began in the Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh back in 1933 and quickly spread to other Protestant churches and denominations in the United States and around the world. It is a day when many churches have a service of Holy Communion. Okay, not every church, not every denomination, and that's a sad thing. But for all the churches who do participate, it's a wonderful thing. Regardless of whether these churches have communion every day or every week or once a month or only four times a year or maybe only on Maundy Thursday, they adjust their communion schedules as necessary to make sure that they, along with so many other churches around our planet, have communion on this one day. Just think about that. It's kind of cool to know that your neighbors in other nearby churches, your relatives at churches in other states or maybe even somewhere else in the world, you're all sharing the bread and the cup on the same day. Now they may be doing it differently than here. Maybe little round discs of bread or maybe passing a single loaf around and breaking off a piece. Maybe they're drinking wine or grape juice, <laughs> or as we remember from the height of COVID, whatever drink you had available when it was time for virtual communion through the devotional videos. In short, World Communion Sunday is a day, a time, when we can visualize the unity we have with other Christians around the world. A unity that is usually invisible, and yes, a unity that sometimes gets tested and strained. Consider our first reading, Paul's letter to the Christians in Galatia, a Roman province in the middle of modern-day Turkey. In today's passage, we can hear him both celebrating the equality and unity of all believers in Christ, even while he reminds his readers that they need to practice mutual respect and love and not make distinctions. Hear Paul's wonderful, freeing words, as true today, and as much needed today, as they were 2,000 years ago. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. What wonderful news! No more distinctions based on race or gender or income or social class. All Christians are united together in Christ. They can set their pride or shame aside, knowing that in God's eyes they are all equal. Equally loved by God, equally saved, and deserving of equal treatment along with everyone else in the church. Folks, that they, the Galatian church, that's still us today. As Christians, we are to show mutual love and respect toward each other, regardless of how the world views us. I remember attending one church very briefly, very briefly years ago, the parking lot was full of BMWs and Mercedes. Several women there wore fur coats in the wintertime, 
and they kept their furs on during worship, just so everyone would know how rich they were. Now where Paul, rightly speaking for Christ here, insists that there should be no distinctions, the folks in that church were busy advertising their distinctions, distinctions that the world revels in, but distinctions that the church should actively avoid. Mutual love and respect between believers must not allow, or worse yet, celebrate such worldly distinctions. Or to paraphrase Paul, there is neither male nor female, white nor black, rich nor poor, fashionista nor plain, but all of us are one in Christ. And that is something we demonstrate as we gather together for the Lord's Supper this day. Um, by the way, I'm noticing that sounds like my tongue's getting a little tired. I apologize. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna push on here. Next, we turn to the most ideal picture of the early church found in the book of Acts. Here, Luke, yes, the same Luke who wrote Luke's Gospel, here he describes what life was like among the very first group of believers in Jerusalem. The apostles who led the group were performing signs and wonders, a very convincing way to attract new members, for sure. In Luke's account, these believers shared their belongings with each other, and even liquidated their assets if another believer needed financial help. <laughs> and don't worry, that was then, not now. They were expecting Jesus to return right away. Today, we know that we're in this for the long haul. However, we do still need to help each other where and how we can. Now those believers in Jerusalem gathered daily for worship, and they also met together in their homes for meals, where they probably practiced an early form of communion as well. They praised God continuously. They had glad and generous hearts. And that is a wonderful image. Uh, Non-Christians were so impressed by their actions and their love for each other that many outsiders became believers and joined them. What a beautiful picture. All the believers getting along together, sharing with each other, and attracting new members day by day. I am not going to burst that bubble. Some Bible commentators say that this was an overly idealized image of the church in Jerusalem. Maybe, but I don't know that for sure. Just because we do know that there was conflict in some of the churches that Paul started, and just because we know that there were some disagreements between the leaders in the Jerusalem church, that doesn't mean that there could never have been a high degree of harmony and mutual love and respect between believers. Hi, Scout. Now, maybe we can think of this as the honeymoon period of the very first church that started in Jerusalem. Friends, no church is without its problems, not then, not now. Whatever church you've been in, you may have seen sniping, cliques, conflict, either open or hidden, financial concerns, membership concerns, you name it. The good news here is that Jesus promised long ago, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That's Matthew 16:18. So take heart. Even though we might not be that ideal church described in Acts, we've got Jesus on our side. You can't get better than that. And again, this World Communion Sunday gives us the opportunity to celebrate that unity and togetherness, even if sometimes it's in spite of ourselves. Lastly, 
Let's briefly look at our reading from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, Greece. Here, here the rubber meets the road. In this letter, Paul gives us the very earliest account, even before the Gospels were written, the earliest account of the Last Supper and the institution of what we call the Sacrament of Holy Communion. It's beautiful and simple. But then we also get a dose of reality, because the church in Corinth had all sorts of problems. Paul has heard reports of how the Corinthians have taken the special agape meal, a combination of a sit-down meal and Holy Communion at a believer's house, and turned it into a selfish, status-controlled meal. What should have been a celebration of unity and equality before the Lord and mutual love and respect between believers turned into anything but that. The short version is this. If you were wealthy and you didn't work, you could get to this special gathering early and pig out. But if you were a day laborer or a tradesperson, you'd end up getting there late and there'd be no food left. Not very nice. This is what Paul actually means when he says, All who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. Now I am sorry to disappoint any former confirmands, but in this passage, Paul is not saying you have to have a theologically correct understanding of communion before you can partake of it. No. When Paul says that some of these Christians fail to discern the body, he means they don't truly understand that their brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of income or status or any other distinction, they deserve their love and respect. Together, they are all the body of Christ. And in this case, Discerning the body means not taking advantage of status and pigging out before the others arrive. Discerning the body means being kind and patient so that everyone gets to enjoy a full meal together. Same, same for us today. Now, we don't usually do communion the way they did back then with a full sit-down meal, but that doesn't mean we don't still need to discern the body of Christ when we gather for worship and communion. World Communion Sunday is a powerful reminder that every believer is a part of the body of Christ. As we look around the church this morning, as we see other Christians from other churches at Walmart or Redner's or wherever, we need to remember this. As believers, we are all loved and saved by Christ, and Christ expects us to especially treat each other as the brothers and sisters in Christ that we are, treating each other with mutual love and respect. World Communion Sunday reminds us that there must be no distinctions because we are all one in Christ. Amen. Our invitation to the offering this morning comes from the United Church of Canada. Let our eyes be open to the possibilities held in this community. We share prayer, song, and stories. We break bread and serve as companions for life's journey. We are invited and encouraged to share our financial gifts. By the way, I think you've seen all three cats pass by tonight. We do this knowing that the kingdom will be found in community, and God's work with and for us is never done. Let us gather our offerings for the good of many people. And we join together in our doxology. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. 
a trust, O Lord, from Thee. Our prayer of dedication comes from the United Methodist Church. Beloved and loving God, bless these gifts, that they may bring unity to a world in strife. Bless our lives, that we may bring love to everyone we meet. Bless our church, that our fellowship may be a place of unity and inclusion for all. Amen. And in the United Church of Christ, we also add this. Bless our offerings for neighbors in need, that people far and wide across our nation will know of your love. In Christ's name, we ask all these things. Amen. As we come to the time of the service of Holy Communion, um, pause the video if you need so that you can have your elements ready. And again, I would invite you, if you have an unusual bread, a uh, French brioche, a uh, taco, tortilla, pita, if you have... Um, a wine or a grape juice, something a little different or something that represents another area, another culture. Go ahead, be bold. This is World Communion Sunday, and certainly people around the world do use different things. Now, our service of Holy Communion today comes from the Presbyterian Church, USA. In the silence of the morning, as the new day dawned around the world, God's people began to gather for worship amid the sounds of drums or pipes, strings or organs. And now we too join in this worldwide chorus of those who call upon the name of the Lord. On this World Communion Sunday, we remember especially that the scriptures are fulfilled as people will come from the east and west and from north and south, and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. So come, not because you must, but because you may. Come, not because you are strong, but because you seek God's strength. All those who trust in Jesus are invited to come and join in the feast that God has prepared. Among friends gathered around a table, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Later, after they had eaten, he took a cup of wine and said, This cup is God's new relationship, made possible by my life and death. Whenever you drink it, do it remembering me. So now, following Jesus' example, we take this bread and wine, for in them he is promised to be with us, making us whole, making us one. And in celebration of God's goodness, let us give thanks as we lift our voices in praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, Heaven and earth are full, are full of the majesty of thy glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. O living God, for your blessing in creation, for your image deep within us, for your life in all its fullness, we give you thanks. O Jesus, our brother, for your coming to earth, calling of us as your friends, for your sharing of your life and death, we give you thanks. O Spirit of grace and truth, for revealing yourself in community, healing us in our brokenness, and inspiring us with courage to share, we give you thanks. O Trinity of love, for the promise of a spreading tree giving shade and protection, for the vision of a body in which each part works for the health of the whole, for the invitation to a feast where the despised will be guests of honor, we give you thanks. Where shall we go from your spirit, 
and how could be, we be away from your presence? If darkness covers us and night closes in on us, you are there. For the night is not dark for you, but luminous as the day, and the two are one to you. Where shall we go from your spirit? Your presence is there and here and everywhere. Spirit of the living God, present with us now, breathe in us and on these gifts of bread and wine, that sharing your blessing and your broken life, we may share in your continual presence and reality, and together, as your body, remain in your love. Amen. Look, here is your Lord, coming to you in bread and wine, the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are now ready. So take and eat the body of Christ, broken for us, giving us life. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for us that brings us mercy. If you have young people with you, please gently place your hand on their shoulder or on their head. If you don't have young people with you, think about the young people in your life. Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, neighbors, young people in the community. Holy God, we ask that you would always abide in and with our young people, that they might always abide in you. Amen. And let's join in our prayer after communion. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. God of peace, may this meal shared in the spirit with your son Jesus strengthen us, your people, to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen. And our commission and benediction come from the Uniting Church of Australia. May the God of life be your guide on the road every day. Be your refuge in times of uncertainty, and be your rest in times of fatigue. May the God of life strengthen you when you feel weak, comfort you when you feel sad, and hug you when you feel alone. May the God of life, who loves you and knows you, cover you with the tenderness of a loving parent forever. Amen. And let us also sing the Amen. My singing voice I'm still working on after what I've been dealing with, but here we go. Amen. 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 God bless you and have a good week.